Hello, good evening everyone. This is your tutor for the day five of practice to pass webinar of the AT exam for the September 2021. My name is Mia Saad Muhammad and I welcome all of you on behalf of ACCA. I hope that you are finding these sessions useful and before I start I would like all of the attendees to raise their hands if they can see my screen and can hear what can can hear my voice clearly. Thank you everyone. Now let me take you to our today's question plan and then we'll discuss further. So today I have three questions and one bonus question as well which if we have ample time left at the end of the session we will go through that as well. So the three questions that I have selected are club PLC that is from this 14 attempt although it is from uh, you know quite old attempt but there are a few topics that has been tested in that uh, which I wanted to teach as well and then we have a, a question called Nocturne Limited that is from June 15 attempt again this uh, focuses on various type of uh, topics from VAT which I wanted to discuss and then we have a question from quite latest attempt September December 20 Dorian NT limited so let's start with the first question club PLC and meanwhile if you guys have any questions you can always you know put your questions in the question section moving on to the question As usual, we will start with reading the requirements first to get an idea as to what are the topics that are being tested in the exam and then we'll start reading the scenario itself. You can download these questions from the handout section and if you want to revise these questions or attempt these questions later on, you can find these questions in the Kaplan examination kit as well. Now starting with the requirement state the corporation tax returns required from club PLC in respect of the 16 month period ended 31st March 2020 and the due dates for filing them. So guys can anybody tell me that after the end of the accounting period <clears throat> how many months a company has to submit their tax return. Can anybody tell me in the question section please. How many months a company has to submit their tax return after the accounting period gets end? Now guys, there is a confusion in that. That I can see that there is an answer called nine months. Yes, nine months and one day, but nine months and one day is the answer of the deadline of the tax liability that the company needs to pay. However, tax return can be submitted till 12 months. So the maximum deadline to submit the tax return is 12 months. However, the li liability needs to be paid by nine months and one day. Now, there'll be students questioning, sir, that as to how we can pay the tax if we haven't prepared the tax return because tax return will be telling us the tax liability. A valid point, but HMRC says that if you are unable to uh, prepare your tax return, you should then submit an estimated liability to HMRC and then in the remaining three months you can finalize your tax return and then submit it with the actual one. Otherwise, if you miss this deadline, obviously the HMRC will charge you the interest and penalties. So the correct answer is 12 months. What if if one will not submit the tax returns within this period? Obviously the HMRC will going to charge them with the interest and penalties. So the dates related uh, relating to each chapter you can find into my notes in under the administration section of each chapter. For example, uh, we are talking about corporation tax right now. So the return must be submitted within 12 months of the end of the accounting period. Whenever we came across the question, we first have to figure out that what should have been the actual deadline 
by which the company should have submitted their tax return once we configure that or find out that then we will be able to check how many months the company has submitted the tax return late and then we can calculate the penalty that should be payable because being a layman the client does not know that what will be the penalty what the only thing he knows is that he has missed the tax liability now moving on the late return penalties will be if the one has submitted till three months within zero to three months if you have submitted the return late the penalty is 100 pound if it is more than three months the 100 will add in that penalty and the total penalty will be 200 pounds if you're uh, you're submitting more than six months late till 12 months 200 plus 10 percent of corporation tax and then after 12 months it will be 20 percent of corporation tax so i also have given you the idea as to where you can find dates under the administration section of my notes under each chapter now moving on explain the penalties which may be charged in respect of the late filing of these returns so we not only have to tell the date but we also have to tell the penalties uh, i can tell the date straight away because their year end is 31st march 2020 so they should have submitted the tax return by 31st march 2021 however i don't know right now that when did they actually submitted the return so that is why i cannot calculate the tax liability without reading the question part b compare and contrast a tax advantaged share incentive plan with a tax advantage company share option plan in relation to the flexibility desired by the club plc regarding the employees included in the plan and the number of value of shares which can be acquired by each plan member so guys share option schemes and share incentive plan is a bit tricky topic and student often find it difficult and troublesome as well so we will go through the topic after reading the question so before answering the question we'll go through the topic so i will not only identify and tell you where this has been mentioned in my notes but will also tell you some tips and tricks to learn this topic as well the second is the income tax and capital gains tax implications as well of acquiring and selling the shares under each plan so i do not only have to tell about sip versus csop but i also have to tell the income tax and cgt implications as well c explain whether or not hco will be charged as controlled foreign company cfc for the year ending 31st march 2022 and the availability of otherwise the low profits exemption we have discussed about cfc previously as well that what cfc is normally the cfc is applied as a charge on the companies that try to avoid or evade the tax rather evade the tax illegally by opening a non-resident company and owning less than 25 percent or more than 25 percent of that company so we'll go through the topic again and we'll see what the low profit exemption is out of many exemptions that are available lastly on the assumption that h co is a cfc and no exemptions are available calculated the budgeted cfc charge for cl club plc based on the budgeted results of h co for the year ending 31st march 2022 so you first only have to explain whether or not the company will be cfc and low profit exemption will be available or not and in the second part considering that the exemption is not available we have to calculate the cfc charge as well so the first part relates to explanation rather the second part uh, relates to the calculation as well meanwhile if anybody has any questions they can put into the question section as well etisham i haven't selected a uh, basis period as my topic in the atx webinar but what i can uh, tell you is that i have also conducted the tx webinar last uh, semester as well so what you should do is 
uh, check my TX webinars and in that the day I have selected income tax as a topic I have discussed uh, the basis period in that and do remember one thing students often find basis period troublesome but they forget that the basis period cannot be tested for 50 marks it will maximum be tested by uh, 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 5 to 10 marks so if for example let's say the more chances are that even if it gets tested it will be tested for like 5 marks maybe or max 10 marks but i do not believe that it will be tested for more than 5 marks let's say if it gets tested and you don't know as to how to solve this part what about the remaining 95 percent what happens is we tend to think that much about that five percent that it you know moves our focus or deviates our focus from the remaining 95 percent so i will suggest you guys including basis period that whatever other topics that do that uh, do create trouble for you do remember that all of these topics cannot get tested in the exam so obviously even if that topic gets tested in the exam it will be for five to seven marks so your focus should rather be on the remaining 90 95 percent of the exam to score a pass mark moving on let's read the question we have gone through the requirements Club PLC club PLC a client of your firm requires advice on the penalty in respect of late filing of corporation tax return the establishment of an approved tax efficient share scheme and its shareholding in an overseas resident company club PLC is the resident trading company has been charged a penalty in respect of late filing of corporation tax returns instant intends to establish a tax advantaged share plan okay purchased 30 percent of the share capital of hearts co from mr deck on 1st april 2021 so now guys important point is that we own that company more than 25 percent because if we would have owned less than 25 percent the cfc would not have applied late filing of ct returns i guess this is the heading that relates to part a and by answering this i can easily kick out part a and earn good three to four marks club plc prepared the accounts for the 16 month period ended 31st march 2020 i know the corporation tax for this period were filed on 31st may 2021 so guys they should have submitted it by march 2021 that we have already discussed how many months are they late within three months or more than three months and if yes they do tell me the amount of penalty in the question section as well please which what is the amount of penalty that will be charged on them by hmrc thank you shabina your answer is correct it is within three months now guys what is the amount that should be charged as a penalty if you file your return late but you file it within three months after the deadline the penalty will be 100 pounds so the, it will be a fixed penalty of 100 pounds that will be charged on club plc for filing the return late do remember that there is a concept of persistent pan, uh, penalty the persistent penalty means that you have been consistently you have been consistently filing late returns for last three years if that is the case in the fourth year hmrc will replace this penalty of 100 with 500 now this is the deadline but Shabina, you have rightly identified there will be two tax returns that will be submitted because they have submitted the tax return for 16 months and the tax ret return cannot be for more than 12 months. So, uh, so that is why they have to divide it in two period. The first will be for 12 months. If they are starting from April, you uh, if they are ending it on uh, march sorry you can deduct the six months i guess it will be october 
or September rather so the return will be submitted into two periods uh, first for 12 months and then the remaining six months so we have not only tell them that what is the deadline but we have also informed them that they will be charged with a fixed penalty of 100 because they have submitted the return late within three months second approved tax efficient share plan the plan will either uh, be a tax share incentive plan or a tax advantage csop if a sip the shares would be held within the plan for five years if a sip members will not be permitted to reinvest dividends in order to purchase further shares if a csop the options would be exercised within five years of being granted in both cases it can be assumed that the plan members would sell the shares immediately after acquiring them these are the important points because this will help me in telling them the income tax implications and cgt implications do remember that whatever option they select the employees will be or the members will be holding the shares for five years and they will soon they will uh, dispose of uh, dispose uh, the shares off as soon as they will get them now what is the flexibility that club plc wants to require the flexibility is the employees who can be included in the plan the number of value of shares which can be acquired by each plan member so i will make these two as a headings and tell them first that what sip is what csop is and then my focus will be to tell them about these two things after telling them this i will be focusing on the income tax and cgt implications of both firstly the sip and then the csop so let me take you to my notes first under the income tax section you can find this topic so csop is a approved HMRC's share option scheme. One of the advantages of providing this scheme is that you have the option to select group of peep employees. It needs not to be extended to all employees, means that if the company has introduced the scheme, the company does not have to welcome or request participation of everyone in that. The comp it is the company's discretion that they can offer the scheme to a selected group of employees. However, there is a maximum limit that the maximum options that can be granted to each employee is 30,000 per employee. This is the maximum limit. Now, what is the tax treatment? There are some other conditions, but these are not required here. Uh, mainly, what we will mention is that the period of the tenure of the options can be within three to 10 years. Now, as far as the tax implications are concerned, do remember because these are the approved share option schemes, there will be no tax implications on the grant date. And I will remind all of you that the grant date is the date on which the company made promise to give the employees shares at the later date. Exercise date is the date on which the employees actually get the shares meaning the company actually is fulfilling the promise and disposal date is the date in on which the employees are actually selling the shares so if the share option scheme is approved there will be no tax implications on grant date means the promise date and the exercise date the dates on which the shares will actually be distributed to employees there will be no tax implications meaning that approved share option schemes are out of the scope of income tax unless one exception that we have discussed already in one of the questions but that is only for emi now let's talk about the capital gains tax implications the capital gains tax implications means that what will be the cgt that will be paid on these shares so the cgt will be paid that uh, on the difference between market value at the disposal date less the market value 
at exercise date whatever is the difference it will be chargeable to capital gains tax but the catch in this question is the employees will gonna sell the shares as soon as they get them means the disposal date and the exercise date will be the same if the disposal date and exercise date will be the same the market value at the disposal date and the exercise date will be the same as well meaning the cost and proceeds will be the same as well meaning that there will be no capital gains as well so in this way if the company's employees are being granted with the csop shares do remember only in this unique scenario there will be no income tax and capital gains tax implications whatsoever and i have told you why there will be no income tax implications and why there will be no cgt implications now if you have any question regarding that put it in the question section i will try to answer them after going through this topic then let's talk about share incentive plans there is only one type of approved share in incentive plan of hmrc and that is sip now what are the tax implications of sip there you can find in my notes that under sip each employee can be granted 3600 shares to their employer and these are called free shares. then the employees can further buy shares in proportion to their free shares and that can be lower of 1800 pounds or 10 percent of their salary whatever is lower meaning they, that they cannot buy more than 1800 pound of partnership shares then they can buy further shares at another instance called free matching shares they should be on two to one basis of their partnership shares already purchased now there are three instances and it is the choice of the company that they may only issue free shares they not offer partnership shares later on so obviously there will be no free matching shares as well if the company chooses to issue partnership shares later on they may not choose to issue free shares free matching shares so it is the company's discretion now however let's back get back to the question and check that what are the two things that club plc was looking for the first was the employee who can be included in the plan in sip i have told you that only selected employees can be offered however so, uh, uh, in csop sorry however in sip the problem is that the shares need to be offered to all of the employees so this is the main difference between csop or sip that in csop you can offer the shares to selected group of employees however in sip you may have to issue the shares to or everyone you have, may have to offer the shares to everyone not issue because when you offer it is employee's discretion whether he accepts your offer or not now the second is the number of value of the shares which can be acquired i have told you that in csop the company has the option to provide 30000 shares uh, well, uh, worth of shares to each employee however in sip you can only firstly give them maximum shares of 3600 then it is your choice if you want to issue free for, uh, further partnership shares they can be 1800 or 10% of your salary and if you choose to issue further shares called free matching shares they will be 2 ratio 1 in proportion to the partnership shares as far as the tax implications are concerned we are done with the csop implications let me take you to sips implication do remember that if the shares are completely held for five years under sip there will be no income tax implications and the cgt will be market value disposal date less the market value at withdrawal date but as the employees are selling the shares immediately after withdrawing in this case there will be no cgt however 
if the employees chooses to not to keep the shares for five years and they sell it between three to five years there will be a charge to it and nic but it will be on one of the lower values either the market value at withdrawal date on which they are you know withdrawing their shares or market value at grant date on which the promise has been made and then there will be cgt implications as well obviously between the proceeds less market value at withdrawal date however if the shares are being held at less than three uh, three years then the it and ni will be applicable on market value at the withdrawal date and gain and loss will be calculated on proceeds less market value at withdrawal date in this case as well however we will not be mentioning these two instances in the because in the question it is mentioned that the employees will keep the shares for five years so i will just tell them that because the employees will keep the shares for five years that is why there will be no income tax and nic on that and because they are withdrawing uh, the disposing of on the same day on which they are withdrawing the shares that is why there will be no cgt as well so I hope that I have answered uh, your questions as well as the requirements. Moving back. Before I move on, let me answer your questions. Iman has asked a question related to what so Iman I will answer it after uh, we'll solve the question. Uh, Shabina, uh, you have asked uh, a question, but yes, you are getting too technical. But the thing is, keep it simple. You have asked that because the return is being divided into two parts, as far as the first part is concerned of the question. Uh, does the penalty needs to be divided into two parts, or the deadline did, needs to be divided into two parts? The answer is no. Whether you submit the tax return in two parts, three parts, or whatever parts. Whenever the last part ends, for example, in this, the maximum it can be for 12 months. So they are preparing the returns for 16 months. So the later part of four months end on 31st March 2020. Whenever the last part gets end, add one year in that to calculate the deadline. That is the deadline. So they have to submit the tax return of both parts, the 12 month part or the four month part by this date. I hope I have answered your question. Going on to the last part. Do remember a very good tip to answer the question. Whatever the examiner has asked, made them the headings and then under that explain. For example, in this, the employees who can be included. So you'll make this heading and tell in CSOP uh, only selected people can be offered and under SIP everyone. And then under this, tell them about 30,000 limit and 3600 limit of SIP. Now moving on to the last part of the question. Hartsco is a resident in the country of S. Mr. Deck continues to own 25% of the company share capital. Keiko, a company resident in country of S, owns the remaining 45%. So 45 plus 25, 70%. And then we have the remaining 30%. We have just bought it from Mr. Deck. We the club PLC. Budgeted results of age go for the year ending 31st March 2022 trading profits are 330,000 out of which 30% relates to us because we only own 30% of the company chargeable gains of 70,000 all of age co profits have been artificially diverted from the UK. So it is clear that because the profits are artificially diverted from UK it will become a CFC unless we will be saved by the help of any exemption. H Co will pay a corporation tax at the rate of 11% in the country of S. H Co will not pay a dividend for the ending 31st March 2022. 
so this rate will be used for calculating the cfc charge as well as the dtr now in the requirement we have to tell whether h co will be regarded as a cfc yes it will be regarded as a cfc why because it has been created or bought for artificially diverting the profits from uk and secondly we own more than 30 percent of that then i have to tell other availability of the low profits exemption so i'll take you the notes in the chapter corporation tax and the last topic is cfc now I have already told you that what the CFC is. Let's quickly go to the exemptions. There are several exemptions exempt period excluded territories low profit low margin and several others. However, in this question, we have only been asked about the low profit exemption. The low profit exemption applies if the company that is being categorized as CFC has taxable trading profits of in total of 500 or less and of which 50,000 are comprises of non trading profit. So both condition needs to be fulfilled. So let's quickly check in the question that whether it uh, both conditions are being fulfilled or not. So the trading profits of the company is less than 500,000 and the non trading profits called chargeable gain are more than 50,000. So guys you tell me whether the company fulfills the low profit exemption or not. Yes or no? Come on, guys, I need more answers. The answer is no. Why? Because the total profits are although less than the 500,000, but out of that, the non trading income which does not come from the activity for which you are trading that is chargeable gains. So chargeable gains are not coming from activity. They are coming because or you, they, they have been realized because you might have sold something which you have bought later on at a higher price. So the chargeable gain is a non trading income and it is more than 50,000. So both condition needs to be fulfilled. Therefore, the company will not be able to claim the low profit exemption. Now as the company is unable to claim the low profit exemption and in the last part of the question I remember that I have to assume that the company assuming will not getting any exemptions we have to calculate what will be the CFC charge. So let's go and quickly calculate the CFC charge for that I'll be using spreadsheet. So CFC charge first of all we have to see that what are the taxable total profits now the profits are 330,000 as per the question however because we only own 30% of the company so our share is 30% that is ninety nine thousand is our share. So, considering if we have to pay CT on these profits, It will be 18810. However, DTR is available because the company is paying the tax in the country of S as well, and it will be 18810. So we are paying the 11% tax on the same amount of profits in the country of S.
by putting the minus sign in the very start the whole of the figure will become negative so this is the remaining tax that i have to pay in the uk after claiming the dtr this is the cfc charge 7920 now guys quickly raise your hands if you have understood this question all of the topics that i have taught in this question please raise your hands now you can post any question related to any topic in the question section as we have finished the question and i will start with one of the question related to what asked by a student it says if a company only supplying zero rated supplies that are above the threshold can companies still be exempt for VAT registration? No. The thing is, you have to consider zero rated supplies as a taxable supplies. So if a company is making taxable supplies, it is compulsory for the company that if they exceed the threshold, they have to register. So as far as the registration is concerned, it is for taxable supplies. Now it depends on your business whether you are doing standard rated supplies or zero rated supplies but both are categorized as taxable supplies yes if but if you are only making exempt supplies then it is your option because you may not need to have to register for that i hope iman i have answered your question if, if anybody has any other question they can post in the question section So guys this question related to few important topics one was CFC charge one was the share option schemes that and the it is quite popular technique of examiner to get uh, to test the comparison between different plans and to ask you what are the advantages and disadvantages of one versus the other including their tax implications and in the first part I have tried to emphasize that if you have a good knowledge of the dates you can easily score two to three marks the knowledge of dates and penalties will help you a lot okay we have one more question uh, saying of what if one only does ex exempt sales are there any benefit for registration but uh, Rakesh if you are only making exempt sales you are you cannot register for that you can only register for that if you are making some sort of even if they are little in quantity but some sort of standard or zero rated supplies if your business is only to make exempt sales you cannot register for that even voluntarily because you will not be able to charge output VAT, and it is obvious that you will be only claiming input VAT. So HMRC does not allow that. Okay, guys, so let's take a break of five minutes and then we'll be back and then we'll continue with our next question.
Okay, students, uh, let's resume. Okay, one student has asked question, can I explain degrouping charge? We have just discussed uh, degrouping charge yesterday in a question, Grant Limited, in quite detail. I can quickly give you an overcap. Uh, otherwise, what you can do is that you can uh, watch yesterday's recording. The degrouping charge, as the name suggests, occurs when you degroup a company, means you sell a company out of the group. It only occurs when that company that is being sold out of the group has purchased any assets from other group member in the last six years. Now, why the degrouping charge is being applied on that? Because when that company was in the group as a group member, it must have purchased the assets from that other company on no gain no loss and thus the seller didn't paid the capital gains tax on that or the corporation tax on that at that time and the company availed the exemption of being a group member as the company is now being sold out of the group hmrc wants the tax that they have given you before as a group member so that is the advantage that you may have to return. So it happens when a company has taken an asset from any of the other group members before getting out of the group in the last six years. If it is a land and building. So on land and building the stamp duty land tax is also ne uh, needs to be paid by the purchaser. So being a group member the company must not have paid that as well. So if the company is being uh, kicked out of the group within three years then the stamp duty land tax needs to be paid back to HMRC as well. But within three to six years only corporation tax within zero to three years both corporation tax and stamp duty land tax. But the stamp duty land tax only applies on land and building. If it is any other type of asset then only corporation tax. I hope at the sham I have explained uh, or answered your question. But for further detail I will suggest you to watch yesterday's recording. Now let's move on to our second question. Our second question is Nocturne, Nocturne Limited from June 15. You can download this question from the handout section. And meanwhile, if you have any other question, please put it into the question section. As this is the last day of our session, try to post as many questions as you can so I can answer that and you can make the full use of these sessions. Nocturne Limited, as usual, we will first read the requirements and then come back to the question. Explain with the aid of supporting calculations which of the two proposed methods providing the laptop computer to Jed would result in the lower after tax cost for Nocturne Limited. Now company is providing some benefit to someone Jed. Now I have to check that whether Jed is an employee, an employee plus shareholder or only the shareholder because the tax implications will be different in each scenario. But it is a very common type of part in which you have to compare two options and tell that which will result in lower after tax cost for the company. We need to ignore VAT for this question. That's fine. Then in the second part, we need to explain the income tax implications for Siglo of providing the loan to Nocturne Limited. Okay, we have to check who Siglo is, who is providing the loan to Nocturne Limited. Is he a shareholder, a director, or what? Now, Determined by the requirement C first. Determined by reference to the de minimis test one and two, Nocturne Limited's recoverable input VAT for the year ended 31st March 2021. Now, guys, the de minimis tests are the topic of value added tax, and they are usually for the businesses that do both taxable sales and exempt sales. These are called partially exempt businesses as well. Why? Because they partially make exempt sales as well as taxable sales. Now, it is the requirement of every business, or you can say 
need of every business to claim as many amount of input VAT as they can. So for the exempt businesses, obviously they might be incurring or suffering by input VAT on items that are being used on taxable sales as well as exempt sales. They will be able to recover the input VAT portion that has been spent on taxable sales, but they will not be able to recover the input uh, uh, input VAT portion suffered on exempt sales. For example, there is a college and college is providing certain courses that are exempt and certain courses that are taxable. Now obviously the college it, it might not be possible for the college to open a separate building for the exempt courses. So in the same building and in the same classes might be there are a few courses being taught that are taxable and that, that uh, and some of them can be exempt. Now obviously all of the input VAT that the college is being uh, suffering on the uh, on their business. Some of them relates to their exempt sales. HMRC says now what you have to normally do is. Calculate how much total sales out how much out of your total sales are the exempt sales. So let's say there is a business who is making 20% exempt sales and 20% taxable sales and they are incurring two types of input VATs. First input VAT is that can directly attributable or directly traceable that the they have been suffered on the taxable sales, but there are some Input VATs that cannot be directly traced. For example, let's say if I talk about the electricity, the electricity cannot be directly calculated that how much is being used on the exempt courses and how much are, is being used on the taxable courses. However, I might have purchased few items of machinery or plant or any other electronics that is only required to teach exempt courses now that I can directly trace that these are the things that I have bought on which I have suffered input VAT, but this is only for exempt sales. This is what do I mean by directly attributable or directly traceable and indirectly attributable or indirectly traceable. Or unattributable. For unattributable input VAT you cannot recover that input VAT. Now is there any option that we can? Yes, there is. There are certain tests that HMRC has mentioned named de minimis tests. If any of the tests can be passed, we can recover all of our input VAT whether it is been suffered on taxable or exempt sales. So now it says very much administration and time saving cost to business, but also they'll be able to recover their input VAT without making any discretion and it will also makes the recovery higher as well. So that is why the de minimis tests are being used, but they are only available or needed by the business which are partially exempt businesses. So we'll look at what are the uh, type of test and uh, uh, a, when we'll be studying the question. So before answering the part, I'll take you to the test and we'll discuss that there. Part C2 relates to advice Seglo of the Nocturne's limited eligibility of the annual test for computing the amount of recoverable input VAT for the year ended 31st March 2022 and the potential benefits to be gained from its use. Now I can tell you briefly, but we will discuss in detail when we'll be doing the question that what annual test is. Annual test means that there is a choice that rather than applying these tests every quarter because the tax returns of VAT are normally submitted as the frequency of either monthly or quarterly. So rather than applying these tests every quarter, you have the option to apply these tests annually once a year. It will also save quite a lot of time and administration cost, but there are certain conditions that needs to be fulfilled if you want to apply the test annually rather than quarterly. So we will discuss it later on that. What are the conditions? 
so let's start reading the question now if anybody of you has any questions they can put the question in the question section nocturne limited the partially exempt company for the purposes of value added tax part requires advice on the corporation tax implications of providing an asset to one of its shareholders the income tax implications for another shareholder for making loan to the company and simplifying the way in which it accounts for what nocturne limited is a uk resident trading company prepare accounts to 31st march annually it has four shareholders each of whom owns 25 percent of the company's or ordinary share capital owns a laptop computer which it purchased in october 2017 for 1200 and which has a current market value of 150. that's fine has purchased no other plant and machinery for several years and the written down value of its main pool is 150 uh, the is nil provision of a laptop computer to one of the nocturne limited shareholder i guess this under this heading i will be able to find the answer of the first part nocturne limited is considering two alternative ways of providing laptop computer in the year ending 31st march 2022 for the personal use of one of its shareholders jed jed is neither a director nor an employee of nocturne limited so guys do remember that he is not at all an employee of the company is only a shareholder now what is the difference of the rule guys if the person is employee director or a uh, any other in in a, any other capacity is participating in the business along with being a shareholder he will be considered as an employee and anything that the company may provide him it will be a taxable benefit in kind for him and the company needs to pay class 1a nic on that however if an employee if a shareholder is not an employee he is only a shareholder neither a director nor an employer then the rules are different and the rule states then then whatever you want to give to your shareholder only be it a cash be it anything in terms of asset or any benefit everything will be treated as you are providing him a dividend so if we are providing jed a laptop let's say it will be considered that we have given him the dividend equivalent to the amount of the market value of the laptop so do remember that however the company will not have to pay any nic on that and the company will not be able to claim any capital ounces for that item why because the company is not using it either for its business or any of its employees it is buying at at one hand and giving it straight away to its shareholder on the other hand so the biggest loss to company is that it will not be able to claim any capital ounces on buying this item the second is it will be treated as a dividend which are deduct uh, get which gets deducted from profit after tax thus resulting in no ct saving an advantage is company will not have to bear class 1a nic a disadvantage for the shareholder is that it will be treated as a dividend it will be taxed at whatever the applicable rate of dividend is on that person now option one Nocturne Limited will buy a new laptop computer for 1800 and give it immediately to Jed. And option two is Nocturne Limited will gift its existing laptop to Jed and will purchase a replacement for use in the company for 1800. Now, guys, let's quickly kick out the first option as I have already explained to you that if the company will buy it and straight away give it to Jed, the company will not be able to claim capital ounces. It will company will not be able to claim any other deductions for that rather it will be treated as a dividend and jed has to pay dividend ta uh, tax on that however the company will not also have to pay class 1a and ic on that as far as the option 2 is concerned if 
the company give the old laptop to Jed, it will be considered as if company has sold this laptop to an unconnected person. Now, if you remember, the market value of the company is laptop was 150. However, the cost is nil. Why? Because company's main pool value was nil. So 150 minus zero equals to 150 of balancing charge means that the company has to pay 19% tax on this balancing charge. Now, if I have to calculate the after tax cost for the company on that in the second option, there will be an added advantage to the company that company is giving old laptop to Jed and buying a new laptop for itself. If the company is buying the new laptop itself, the biggest advantage will be that the company will be able to claim capital nouns. For example, as it is a laptop, it will qualify for 100% AIA. So company will be able to claim the 100% deduction and 19% tax saving on that. So let's op quickly open the spreadsheet and calculate that what will be the after tax cost in both options. I have already told you that in first option, option one, the after tax cost for the company will be 1800. Why? Because there will be no tax savings. The company will buy the laptop and straight away give it to the jet. However, in the second option, let's quickly calculate option two. Firstly, the tax savings that the company will be able to achieve is AIA. 100% AIA. On laptop. And 19% CT saving on that. Nineteen percent CT saving on that. So guys, the hundred percent AIA will be obviously eighteen hundred times nineteen percent tax saving. The tax saving will be three hundred and forty two pounds. However, the company has to pay tax on the balancing charge. How much tax will be paid on that one fifty times 19%. So 150 times 19%. This will be the tax that the company needs to pay, and this is the tax saving that the company will be able to achieve. So if I net both of them, this is the CT payable if the company disposes of the old laptop to jet and buy the new laptop for itself now we have to tell the after tax cost so the after tax cost will be eighteen hundred that is the price of laptop let's deduct three one four i i have rounded it off one four eight six will be the after tax cost of the laptop for the company now in option a the after tax cost was 1800 in total in option b it's one four eight six so i will ask all of you to answer me in the question section which option is better option one or option two Which option is rather more beneficial for Nocturne Limited if they have to give Jed the laptop? Option two, guys, and reason because it results in lower after tax cost. When we have to calculate the benefit, the benefit needs to be higher off both. When we have to calculate the cost, it needs to be lower of both options. So do not confuse it is easier if you are calculating the benefit you need to opt for the highest one if you are calculating for cost you have to opt for the lowest one so guys i hope that i have explained this part 
let's talk about the remaining parts let's go back to the question loan for seglo Signal will Signal will loan 60,000 to Nocturn Limited on 1st October to facilitate the purchase of new equipment. Signal is both a shareholder of Nocturn Limited and the company's managing director, so his employee as well as shareholder. So he is giving the loan to company to buy an equipment, not company giving him the loan. So there is no benefit for Signal, rather he is providing the money to the company. Nocturne will pay interest at commercial rate on the loan from Siglo. That's fine. The company is paying him the commercial rate. Siglo will borrow the full amount of the loan from his bank on normal commercial terms. So Siglo does not have this money on his own. He's rather taking the loan from bank himself and then giving this money back to the company. And then what will be happening? He will be receiving the interest from company on the one hand, but rather paying the interest to the bank on the other hand. So let's talk about the tax implications from both point of view. First, let's talk about the Nocturne's point of view. There will be no tax implications. Why? Because the company is getting a loan and the company will later off later on will be paying back this loan. So there is no tax implications for Nocturne Limited. The only thing is that the whatever the interest the company is paying to Nocturne Limited, the company can, de can deduct that from their corporation tax and that can result in savings. As far as for Seglo is concerned, providing the loan does not create any tax uh, payable for him. Rather, when he will be providing the loan to the company because his company is a closed company and what do we i mean by closed company a company that has less than five shareholders or if more shareholders all should be directors or it should be controlled by a majority of the shareholders if this is the criteria then the company becomes closed company and if you provide loan to your closed company it becomes a qualifying loan. Now, what is the advantage of being a qualifying loan? Whatever interest you are paying on this loan to bank, whatever interest Siglo is paying to bank, Siglo can deduct that interest from its taxable incomes and thus reduce its taxable income by that amount. Considering Siglo is a high rate band taxpayer, he'll be saving 40% amount of the tax on that interest. So I have explained the point of view of both not only the Seglo's point of view, but also the company's point of view as well. I hope I have answered the question. If anybody has any question in mind, they can ask in the question section. Now we can move on to the last part that is part partial exemption. Nocturne Limited is partially exempt for the purposes of VAT. Nocturne's taxable turnover for the year was 240 VAT exclusive. Nocturne Limited turnover for the year as a whole for VAT purposes comprised 86% of taxable supplies and 14% for exempt supplies. That's fine. The input VAT suffered by Nocturne Limited on expenditure during the year ended 31st March 2021 was wholly attributable to taxable supplies 7920, wholly attributable to exempt supplies 1062, wholly attributable means wholly traceable. It can be directly traced that this has been suffered on taxable supplies. So that can be recovered. This can be directly traceable that this has been incurred on exempt supplies. So that is irrecoverable. It cannot be recovered. Unattributable. Unattributable means this has been incurred on both. However, we cannot directly trace how much relates to exempt supplies, how much from taxable. So how do we then figure out? HMRC says multiply it 
by the num amount percentage of taxable supplies and exempt supplies so uh, in our case the percentage is i guess 85 and 15 86 and 14 it, it is so out of that 86 but we will assume relates to taxable supplies and can therefore be claimed and 14 percent of that amount cannot be claimed so two amounts cannot be claimed 14 percent of 4150 and 1062 whatever is the total of both this cannot be claimed however if we will be able to pass any of the de minimis tests then we will be able to recover the complete input bad whatever is the sum of these three figures we will be able to recover that that is why the tests are for and they are only applicable on the partially exempt businesses meaning businesses which are making both taxable and exempt supplies now Seglo has heard about an annual test for computing the amount of recoverable input part during an accounting period and would like more information about this. That's fine. Let's go and check that what are the de minimis limit tests are and what is annual accounting test. You can find this in the topic under the VAT chapter called partially exam businesses de minimis limit so guys for de minimis limits there is one condition and then out of after fulfilling that condition we can move on to three tests out of which any one can be satisfied but if we do not fulfill this condition we cannot even apply any of the tests so this is a condition that is a must and only then we can move on to the test so the condition is that your exam supplies should be less than 50% of your total supplies and this condition is being fulfilled in limited because their exam sales are only 14% way lower than 50% Then it means that we can move on to one of the tests for Nocturne limited now any one of the tests can be satisfied and will be able to completely recover the input part now do remember for test a and b they're pretty straightforward and you do not have to do any workings However, if these two will not be satisfied, we then have to apply C and for that we have to make this table. However, if we will be able to satisfy any of A or B, we, would, we do not have to make this table. So do remember that. So the first is total input watt, whatever your answer is, should be less than 625 per month on average or if the data is given to you in the question for quarter you can multiply this limit with four or with three sorry however if the data has been given in the form of annual you can multiply it by 12 so this limit can be 7500 for annual sales now we will check later on whether this test is being satisfied in Nocton's case or not Then we have total input VAT minus input VAT directly attributable to taxable supplies. Whatever is left, is that less than 625 per month or not? Meaning less than 7500. We will check later on whether this satis test gets satisfied in the case of Nocturne or not. If both of these tests does not get satisfied, only then we'll make a table that total non claimable input part is less than 625 per month on average or not or less than 75 percent 7500 annually now to calculate the total non claimable input part what do you have to do is you have to divide your unattributable watt into two percentages like i have recently told you in Nocton's case unattributable unattributable watt will be divided into two parts 86 percent and 14 percent so the non-claimable portion is the 14 percent along with the watt directly suffered on input uh, exam sales these two figures will be added and we will check that whether they are less than 75 percent or not but we do not have to do that if we satisfy any first two of the tests 
now moving on to the question back let's quickly check that which test gets satisfied if any in Nocturne's case so guys I have to first calculate what is their total it input what so I will add all three figures 7920 plus 1062 plus 4150 so their total input what is 13132 the test a says that your total input watt should be less than 7500 so you can clearly see that my total input watt is way above 7500 i do not satisfy the first test i now have to move on to the second test the second test says total input watt less watt attributable to taxable supplies so i have the total answer that is 13132 all I have to do is to deduct the VAT attributable to taxable supplies out of that, and that is 7920. So I will deduct 7920, and my answer is 5212. So it is less than 7500, meaning I do satisfy the second test. And what is the benefit of you know satisfying the second test? I will be able to recover the complete 13132 input VAT from HMRC even the VAT that relates to exempt supplies as well I hope I have clarified and you know cleared this little bit tricky topic and if it now gets tested in your exam you'll be easily able to answer that now just for the sake of concept let us apply the third test here as well so if in question you came across such situation that the first two tests does not get satisfied then you may have to apply the third test however here we do not have to i am just doing it for teaching purposes for that you can follow the same pattern that is available in my notes however your cho it is your choice to either follow the total column or not now i will here just make two columns that is claimable watt and non claimable watt so this will be our claimable column and let's say this is our non claimable column Now, one by one, the attributable to taxable supplies, I can copy it from here. And if when you'll be solving the question, you can copy it from the question as well, rather than typing it yourself. Attributable to taxable supplies, attributable to exempt supplies. And then there is unattributable unattrib VAT. now we can copy the figures as well it's 7920 the taxable supplies vat is claimable unattributed unattributable is non claimable obviously and sorry i have wrongly pasted it here it's non claimable and the unattributable i have to divide it it is 4150 so this 4150 will be multiplied by once with 86 percent and once with 14 percent the 86 percent that relates to we're assuming that which relates to taxable supplies will be in this column and the remaining 40 14 percent will be mentioned in this column so let's quickly apply the formulas here. We can copy the same formula, but we can change the percentage from the above. Now, here we can 
post their totals and guys you can see that our the last test says your non claimable input VAT should be less than 7500 and there you can see that our non claimable VAT is less than 7500 as well however we do not have to apply this test because we have already passed the second test so i hope that i have answered if you have any question you can post it into the question section and we can quickly check their total you can see here the excel software tells you the sum even without telling the sum formula it's 13132 mean i have calculated or bifurcated the text appropriately or rightly. Moving on to the last part of the question that asks us about the annual accounting scheme. So let's go to the notes and see what annual accounting scheme is. The business. I have told you needs to apply these tests every quarterly, but they have the choice that they can apply it once in a year, but for that they have to satisfy a few conditions. So what are these conditions? The business can apply the de minimis test once a year. If the business was de minimis in the previous year means that they have applied this test in the previous year. The annual test is applied consistently throughout the current year means that you have consistently checked yourself against the de minimis test this year. And third, the input VAT for the current year is not expected to exceed 1 million, meaning the VAT from all the categories, whether directly traceable, untraceable, or unattributable, every sort of input VAT. Is less than 1 million if you satisfy these three conditions then you have the option that you can elect with HMRC to apply input VAT once a year what it will uh, what is the added advantage of that because you have to apply the test once a year even if you even if you do not satisfy the tests you are recovering complete input VAT every quarter and at the end of the year when you will apply the test, if you do pass, you will keep the input VAT that you have recovered. If you do not pass the test, you will return the input VAT that relates to exempt supplies back to HMRC. But you have to apply the test once a year rather than every quarter. And at the end of the year, you will calculate the annual adjustment whether you need to return the money to HMRC or you successfully passes the annual test. So if you have learned this test and its conditions by heart, you would have scored some easy marks. In this question. Taking you back to the question. Advice Siglo about the eligibility for the annual test. I have told you that if Siglo was is a partial exempt business so they can apply for annual test but i have also told you what are the other conditions and i have also told you the potential benefits to be gained from its use that it will save the administration cost and time and they will be able to recover the out input VAT completely even if they do not pass the test and they only have to apply the adjustment once a year. So guys, if you have any question regarding this, please let me know in the question section or regarding VAT as a whole. If you have any question in mind, please post in the question section. Uh, Russia has asked that do we only have to satisfy one test? Yes. If we pass to any of the test, we can. However, Russia, we have to satisfy one condition as well along with test that our exempt sales should be less than 50% of the total sales. That is the condition that needs to be satisfied must. However, only one test needs to be satisfied. 
I hope I have answered your question. If anybody has any other question related to VAT, they can post in the VAT uh, in the question section. Okay, guys, let's take a break and we will be back after five minutes. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, you can post into the question section and I will answer them after the break.
Okay, guys, let's resume. The next question in our list is DNT Limited. It's of September, December 2020. Let's check the question and what is its requirement, and then we'll start answering the question. Sorry guys, mistakenly in on my file, the requirements doesn't get printed. So we'll open it from the question paper then. As I mentioned before that it is for September, December 2020 attempt, and it is the last question in the exam. So these are the requirements. Explain why T Limited is classed as a closed company for four marks. We have already discussed the definition of closed company that a company is a closed company if it has less than five shareholders and if more than five shareholders, either all of them are directors or majority of the shareholders are controlling the company. Then we we'll look at that either T limited satisfies this criteria. If yes, then T limited is a closed company. If not, then it is not a closed company. Part B explain with supporting calculations the tax implications for both D and T limited. If D repays the 7500 loan on 30th April 2022, or rather than on 30th June 2022. Now guys, obviously it is a hint that there must be some sort of benefit if he repays the loan earlier. So we have to look the question and, and, and with the help of this hint, identify that what is the advantage that one can gain. Then explain with supporting calculations, which of the two alternatives for providing assistance with travel costs will produce the lower overall cost for Dorian. So there will be two alternatives and we have to then check that which will provide the lower of overall cost for Dorian. And we have clearly seen that how popular these type of questions are in almost every attempt that the examiner tries to test your knowledge and check that whether you have an idea to compare between the different situations because if you as I told you that ATX exam is pretty of uh, pretty much of uh, practical nature exam in the real life you tend to came across such situations as well that most of the times what client require is between the decision of two alternatives if you if you uh, for example there was a client of mine who called me yesterday and asked that he has just sold a car. He's a director and shareholder of a company. So he was using the company's car and due to that he has to pay the taxable benefit in kind on that usage of car and his company has to pay the class 1 ANIC. He has now sold that car and he has uh, you know sent me an email and said which will be the beneficial option for me because now I am planning to buy a new car either. I should again buy it on the company's name number one number two should I uh, buy it using finance meanings the lease or using the loan so which option is you know the most beneficial so now what do I have to do in return I have to explain him that what are the three uh, tax implications of three options and under which option does it results the lowest after tax cost? So it is very much common in the real life as well that you came across such questions. And that is why 
you will see this in a, almost every attempt that this type of questions being tested in the exam now with part d state with reasons the due date for filing t limited's corporation tax return for the year ended 30th april 2019 and the implications for t limited in respect of filing it late again what do we have to do first we first have to figure out what is the actual date that by which the return should have been filed as the rear end is 30th april 2019 so guys tell me in the question section what is the deadline of submitting the return and after reading the question we came to learn how late they have filed and according to that we can let them know the penalty for that so please answer me in the question section that what should be the correct deadline james you have told me the deadline of nine months that is for the tax liability to be submitted to hmrc that is not the deadline of the return the deadline of the return is 12 months after the end of the accounting period and its accounting period is ending in 30th april 2019 and from 12 months of that it's 30th april 2020. now moving back Let's read the question now. You have been asked to provide advice to Dorian, the manager and director of T Limited, in relation to T Limited's status as a closed company, the company's provision of employment benefits to D, and the late filing of the company's corporation tax return. That is fine. T Limited. T Limited is a UK resident company and is also a closed company. Okay. Has six directors, Dorian, and five other unrelated individuals. Prepares accounts 30th April each year and always pays all amounts due to HMRC by the due date is not a large company for the purpose of being required to pay its corporation tax liabilities in installments why this is important to mention for the examiner because the due date for the tax return liability to be submitted is different for smaller companies it is nine month and one day and for larger companies it is in four equal installments with three being the payment on account and last being the Balancing payment. Now, T Limited shareholder. It will help us to determine whether the company is a closed company or not. So, the percentage of D's holding is 5%. There are five other directors, each holding 5%. So, the 25% each. Basil, Dorian's father, owns 23%. Guys, do remember when you have to calculate the holding for the closed company, if any of the connected person owns a holding along with you, you and them will be considered as one for the percent for the purpose of uh, the holdings calculation. So Basil, which means now owns 28% rather than 5%. Why? Because his father is related to him. Along with the other four directors, if we combine the five directors, because Dorian is an employee as well, then they own majority of the shareholding. 23% for Dorian, and the remaining five directors own 25%, so that is almost 53%. So they have the most control of the company. Now, because this criteria has been fulfilled, majority of the shareholders can exercise the control in the company this company will now be considered as a closed company if you remember the first requirement was in which you first have to explain what the closed company is so you will just be mentioning the closed company's definition then the question asks that identify the status of t limited whether it is a closed company or not so in the second point you will write as to why 
the D limited is uh, sorry T limited is closed company Stating that majority of the shareholders including Basil's father and his own holding considering one is 53 percent and Therefore it will be considered as a closed company because they are controlling more than 50 percent meanings they have the control of the company Now so with that we are able to answer the first requirements Let's move on to the second one D D has an annual salary of 78,000 from T limited Was provided with an interest free loan of 7500 from T limited on 6th April 2019 Guys can anybody mention the limit below which if the company provides you the loan it is not taxable so the loan is taxable benefit in kind but below which limit it is not taxable please answer me in the question section yes it is 10000 meaning currently the loan that has been given to uh, d by t limited is not a taxable benefit in kind why because it is less than 7500 but the if the company is a closed company so as per the HMRC rule if you pay anything to your shareholder in the form of loan you have to submit notional tax to HMRC on that that is 32.5 percent of the tax as a security to HMRC now why the rate is 32.5 percent if you quickly think or carefully think it is exactly the rate of dividend high rate band 32.5 percent you know what people used to do was rather than taking the dividend from the company because dividend is taxable they used to take the loan from the company and then the company used to write off the loan in their records in this way the shareholder used to get the money without incurring the tax and the company has also written off the money by giving the uh, uh, money back to the shareholder so what HMRC did was they've introduced a rule of notional tax that whenever you give something to your shareholder as a loan you will deposit 32.5 percent of that loan with us as a security whenever your shareholder will write uh, will return you this loan we will return this security back to the company however if the company will write off the loan stating that the shareholder was unable to provide us the loan back then the hmrc will keep that money considering that you may have tried to evade the tax using this strategy so that is why this notional tax rule is now if the company is not a closed company the company has the option or liberty that if the amount of loan is less than 15,000, they do not have to submit the notional tax as a security to HMRC. But if the company is a closed company, you do not have this liberty. So I hope that I have also uh, tried to explain what is the rationale behind the rule. Because the thing is, if you know that what is the rationale behind the rule, it becomes easier to remember the rules now it is already mentioned in the question that t limited will be paying notional tax to hmrc on that loan so we do not have to mention that okay so the loan will be provided on 6th april 2019 and T will repay the loan either on 30th June 2022 but may repay it earlier on 30th April 2022 so he can either pay in June or three months earlier in April so guys let let us quickly go back and check what is the year end of T limited it is 30th April as well now why I have stopped and check the year end the rule says whenever you return the money as a shareholder back to your company the HMRC returns the security back to the company 
after the end of the year end in which you have paid the company back the loan for example the company prepares its accounts 30th april each year if dorian pays the company back the loan on 30th april 2022 meaning he has paid the company loan for 30th april 2022 accounts now the hmrc will return this loan back within 9 months and one day that is january 23 however if we delay the repayment by 3 months this will fall into the next set of accounts that are due for april 2023 So HMRC will then return the money nine months and one day after the 30th April 2023 because the loan has been paid in that year of accounts. So you tell me, wouldn't it be beneficial for D to settle off the loan earlier because in this way his company will gonna get that notional tax refund earlier or almost one and a half year earlier? What do you suggest, guys? Am I right? Yes. Thank you, Rakesh. So the it is right that if the D pays back the company three months earlier, it will fall into the set of accounts of 30th April 2022, and HMRC will pay back the money by. January 23 however if the repayment is delayed by 3 months the refund of notional tax will get delayed almost one and a half year late now if we go and check what was the second requirement explain with supporting calculations what will be the benefit now as far as the calculations are concerned there will be no calculations included why because the 75% loan for the uh, uh, dorian will be an exempt benefit because it is less than 10000 pounds however if we can calculate the notional tax it will be 7500 times 32.5% it will be 2438 pounds almost this is the amount of notional tax that needs to be paid to hmrc and then we will discuss about what will what is the advantage of paying repaying the loan to the company earlier than later so we are done with the second part and we are done with the first part let's go back and discuss the third part by reading the question yes rakesh we can discuss that it will not be a good from cash flows point of view that if the company gets the recovery of the loan versus the refund later rather than sooner so we can discuss that point moving back alternative 1 and alternative 2 for topes limited assistance with dorian's home to work limited t limited is considering two alternatives to assist dorian with cost of his daily travel from home to work for the tax year 2122 alternative 1 On 6 April, T Limited will make an interest-free loan of Dorian of 4,800 equal to the cost of his annual travel season ticket. T Limited will write off this loan on 5th April 2022, and D will incur no additional travel cost under this alternative. Guys, I have a point in my mind. the company has already given him the 7500 loan back in 2019 now the company is planning to give him loan of further 4800 pounds and he has not yet 
paid off the previous loan because he is either planning to pay it off by April 2022 or by June 2022. But on 6th April 2021, that 75% loan will be due. Don't you think that by getting this 4800, he will cross the threshold of 10,000 and this loan benefit will now be taxable benefit in kind? Do you agree guys? Yes, yes, Rakesh, you are right, but only for that tax year. Because at the end of this tax year, the previous loan will be paid by Dorian and this loan will be written off by the company. So at the end of this tax year, both loans will be settled one way or the other. But for this tax year, that is 21-22, the taxable benefit in kind with, uh, will arise for the loan. So calculating using the average method, the start at the start of the period, the loan was 7,500 plus 4800 that is 12300 times 0 0.025 means 2.5 percent of the interest because the benefit is usually on the interest it is 308 pounds roughly if i round it up so that will be the taxable benefit in kind that needs to be paid both answers either average method or accurate or precise method both will result in the same answer sorry rakesh thank you for correcting me the interest rate has been revised by hmrc to 2.25 percent it used to be 2.5 percent last year so if i update my answer it will be 7500 plus 4800 times sorry 12300 times it will be almost 277 277 pound will be the benefit in kind both of the options the accurate method and the precise method will result in same answer reason being as number one it is an interest free loan number two no repayment has been made during the year so both of them will result in the same answer so do not waste your precious time in the exam in calculating first both and then take higher or lower of both do not waste your time in that work or do use your brain smartly that because there is no repayment is being made firstly and secondly it's an interest free loan both will gonna result in the same answer now this is a taxable benefit in kind that will be included in Dorian's taxable income. And what will be the tax on that? Considering he is a higher rate band taxpayer, it will result in 40% tax. Meaning almost 111 pounds, triple one pounds will be the tax that needs to be paid. That is one thing. Then the second problem is that at the end of the tax year, the company is planning to write off the loan. The company is planning to write off the loan and due to that, whenever it is a closed company and you write off the loan, it is considered that you have given it to your shareholder in the form of dividends. So, D will then have to pay the dividend tax on the same amount of the loan that has been given to him in the start of the tax year. That is 4,800 pounds. Considering that he is not taking the dividends previously, I am assuming that his dividend nil rate band will be available. So out of that 2,000 dividends will not be taxed. The remaining dividends of 2,800 will be taxed at 32.5% that is 910 pounds that is the tax 
when the company will write off the dividend plus triple one is the amount of tax that will be payable as a taxable benefit in kind. Now, uh, Rakesh has asked that with uh, no Rakesh, uh, the C NIC will not be payable on that. The class one NIC liability will not be payable on that. Why? Because the loan has not been given to him as a loan. Rather, it has been given as a travel assistance and later of it has been written off as a loan. So the dividend tax will be payable on that. So the total tax in that option will be 1021 pound. That is the tax. Now. Let's talk about the other option. We haven't started it yet or read it from the question. But do remember that in the first option, this is the amount of tax that he has to bear. In second option, the company will give him a mileage allowance for driving his own car to work amounting to 3600 for the year ending 30th April uh, 5th April 2022. T Limited will pay an unconnected company for the parking fee. And D has estimated that its current annual cost from work to home is 5220 including parking fee. Guys, do remember we have to look at them separately. If the company provides you for the mileage allowance for the traveling that is necessary for your performance of duties, then it is an exempt benefit provided that the company has paid you according to HMRC's rates. And what are HMRC's rates? 45 pence per mile. But the thing is, what do I mean by the travel that is necessary to perform uh, that is necessary to perform performance of duties? It is the traveling without which your work is not possible and do remember coming from home to office does not constitute the necessary traveling as per the HMRC's definition meaning if your employer provides you the money to come from home to work your permanent place of work to home. It constitutes a taxable benefit in kind straight away. So this 3600 will become a taxable benefit in kind. Then let's talk about the car parking space. Do remember that if your employer provides you a car parking space, either it is a free space. Or he pays something for that. It is an exempt benefit. So that 1200 will be an exempt benefit. The last point states that D has estimated that his current annual cost of driving from home is 5220, including that parking fee. So because parking fee is an exempt benefit, let's quickly check that what is his traveling cost excluding parking fee. It's 3900 pounds. But the company is only compensating him for 3600 pounds. Meaning that he is paying 300 pounds from his own pocket. So this is the cost that he will have to incur on top of the. On top of the cost that the company is being providing to him. So we'll keep the these costs separate 300 pound. Now let's quickly calculate what will be the tax that will be payable on the taxable benefit in kind. Now Rakesh as this is the money that is directly being given to him for that this purpose. We will include the income tax and NIC as well. So on this 3600 it will be 42 percent tax. And NI. So it's 1512. 1512 is the amount of tax that he has to suffer in this option plus 300 extra money that he has to bear from his own pocket because the company is paying him less. So for him, this option will cost him 1812. 
as compared to the previous option which costed him one thousand and twenty one so the previous option costed him one thousand and twenty one and this option costed him one thousand eight hundred and twelve pounds so let's quickly check that what was our requirement explain with supporting calculations so we have performed the can calculations which of the two alternatives for providing assistant with tra travel cost will produce the lower overall cost for dorian so guys you tell me which alternative provides the lower cost the alternative one or the alternative two in alternative two the cost is 1812 in alternative one it is 1021 i guess so answer me in the question section which alternative alternative one now we will just mention at the very bottom of the answer that alternative one will result in lower benefit Mohammed abdullah adam you have done the calculation wrong the loan is 12,300 at the very start of the year and it is the same at the very end of the year as well Why because the loan has been provided on the very start of tax year So it is not 7,500 in the start of the tax year and not 12,300 at the end of the tax year It should have been the case if the loan has been provided during the year But the loan has been provided exactly on the first day So from the very start of the tax year the loan is 12,300 so even if you take loan at the start of tax year, it is 12,300 plus 12,300 divided it by two, the answer will be the same. That is why I have straight away taken 2.25% of the loan. I hope I have answered your question. Now, let's move on to the last part. State with reasons the due date for filing T limited corporation tax for the year ended 30th April 2019 that we know that is 31st 30th April 2020 and the implications for T limited in respect of filing it late so let's read the question and see that when did they uh, file the return T limited filed its corporation tax return for the year ended 30th April 2019 on 29th august 2020 hmrc's issued a notice requiring the filing of the return on 8th june 2019 delimited had filed its corporation tax return for the year ended 30th april 2018 on 6th july meaning that this return has been submitted late and the previous return has been submitted late as well but all previous CT returns have been filed on time. So this is the second late return. And now because it should have been submitted by 30th April 2020, but it wasn't submitted by 29th August 2020. So I guess the company has filed the return more than three months late. So what should be the amount of penalty? Tell me in the question section. The company has filed return more than three months late, but less than six months. What is the amount of penalty? It's 200 at the sham. You're right. Why? Because up till three months, it is 100 more than three months to but less than six months. It is 200. So 200 will be the fixed penalty that needs to be paid. Now. Although the company has filed its return for the second time in a row late, that is why HMRC will not gonna replace it with persistent penalties. Persistent penalties, I'll explain again, are when you consecutively file three late returns. So on the third time, HMRC replaces in 100 with 500. 
so this 200 will be replaced with 1000 however because this is the second late return that it will be 200 and it will not be replaced by 1000 because all previous tax returns have been submitted late if it would have been the third late return the hmrc would have penalized them with 1000 pounds so it is not a persistent penalty so always look because examiner tries to test persistent penalties as well to make sure that whether you know this concept or not even if you do not you must have to mention to score full marks that the persistent penalties are not applicable here so guys with that we have answered the all the requirements of question and luckily we have saved time for to attempt the last question as well so if you guys have any question please put it in the question section and i will try to answer them after a short break so this time we'll get back after 10 minutes so see you after 10 minutes
so students let's resume and this takes us to our final question today this question is basically from the latest past exam that has been uploaded on the ACCA's website that is for March June 2021 if any of you have appeared in the last two attempts the question might have seemed familiar to you this is not only available to download from the past exam section but this question has also been uploaded by ACCA on the practice CBE practice platform. So if you visit CBE practice platform, you can find this exam called ATX UK June exam 2021 updated syllabus obviously. And this is a 20 mark question and it is the last question of the exam. So as usual, let's read the requirements and because it is a 20 mark question, it it will have the detailed requirements available in this part. However, as compared to section A questions in requirement, you merely find the marking scheme. You should assume that today's date is this explain whether or not a CSOP company share option plan scheme or a SIP share incentive plan will satisfy why limited criteria for a tax advantage share incentive scheme? So we have to see that what the why limited criteria is and income tax implications for the employees for acquiring the shares in each case. So we will again tell the in income tax uh, implications. However, do remember that here it has not been asked to tell the capital gains tax implications as well. So we will only be focusing on the income tax implications. Then calculate with brief explanations the principal private residence relief, PPR and letting relief, if any, which are available to reduce the chargeable gain on D's sale of his house. So obviously if the D would have used this property for his main residence and is now selling the PPR will be available for any of the period in which he has used the house actually occupied the house and there is a period that in which he might not have actually occupied the house but it may qualify for the assumed or deemed occupation periods that has been mentioned by HMRC. Then if out of that any period he has let out the property that gain may be eligible for the letting relief. Moving on to the last requirement. Explain the tax implications of J's gift to the apartment of D on 1st June 2019 if J were to die in December 2024. So I guess this must be related to the IHT. However, the first two parts you are familiar with. I have tried to go through these topics in the previous questions as well. And the reason I have chosen this question is to tell you that see that the topics that we have discussed have been also tested in one of the very latest attempts as well. So if you prepare according to that, or that if you use the reading techniques or the writing techniques that I have tried to talk to you over those over these five days, it will definitely help you to score a good mark in the exam. Now, <clears throat> let's move to the question and read the questions. Let us first read the introduction. You should assume that today's date is 1st December 2021. D, the managing director of Y Limited, has requested advice on the tax implications of Y Limited setting up a tax advantage share incentive scheme for its employees. He also requires advice on the capital gains tax relief available on the sale of his house. I guess that is what the PPR part and letting relief part is. And the potential IHT liability on the gift of an apartment. So I was right that this part relates to inheritance tax. 
The following exhibit available on the left hand side of the screen provides the information relevant to the question. Y limited and icon. The information should be used to answer the question requirements within your chosen response option. That's fine. Let's read the scenario now. I will zoom it so that everybody can see it clearly. Why limited? Why limited is a UK resident trading company is considering setting up either a company share option plan or a share incentive plan both of which would be offered to selected employees that's fine why limited criteria for its tax advantage share incentive scheme employees will be selected to join scheme department on their period of employment with the company that's fine if the scheme is a CSOP, each employee will be offered options to purchase worth up to 3000 each year. Employees will exercise the options five years after being granted them. If the scheme is a SIP, each employee will be given free shares up to worth 3000 each year. That's fine employees will remove the shares from the plan after five years so they will withdraw it after five years daikon was gifted an apartment by his aunt chikama on 5 june 2019 has never lived in this apartment will sell the house he currently lives in and move into this apartment on 31st december 2021 so that is why he's selling his house in which he currently resides in and now he'll be moving to the gifted apartment so i guess this is the part that relates to the ppr and the letting relief d purchased his house on 1st july 2013 when he was employed overseas d did not own any other property between 1st july 2013 and 4 june 2019 the sale of the house on 31st december 2021 will give rise to a chargeable gain of 145000 so we will use this figure to calculate the reliefs and the first two points will help us to figure out that which of the period we should use for the letting relief uh, for the ppr sorry the occupation of his current house he moved into the house on 1st January 2014 on his return to the UK. So you have to calculate that from January 2014 till December 2021. How many years or months it will become? As far as the years are concerned, they will be almost 8.5 years. And we can multiply it by 12 to calculate the months. Now d has occupied the house since 1st january 2014 apart from the period from july 2015 to 31st december 2016 i guess that is again one and a half year when he was gone once again employed overseas okay that's fine so he bought the house then after a certain period of time uh uh, he bought the house from almost July uh, 2013, but he moved to the house when he returned to the UK on January 14. Then he later on again moved out of the house for overseas employment and then he got back after 1.5 years. Daikon resumed exclusive occupation of the house on 1st January 2017 obviously on his return again since 1st april d has let the basement of the house which comprises 25 percent of the property for residential use retaining excessive retaining exclusive occupation of the remaining 75 percent for himself so again guys now this for these period i guess that is from if i start from april 17 till the end of the period 2021 it will be 4.5 years almost so 
for these years he has partially occupied the house and partially let the house so the period for which the house was partially let will not gonna qualify for ppr this period will rather be available for the letting relief so that is why we that uh, so here we have to remember the or keep ourselves uh, focused for letting relief now the last part gift of the apartment i guess this is the part which relates to the iht when j gifted the apartment to d on 5th june 2019 it was on the condition of her continuing to live in the property for the foreseeable future on 12th march 2021 j began living with her sister and she removed the condition she had previously imposed on the gift from that date so guys anybody remember that which topic it is from iht any clues answer me in the question section if you have the idea from which topic does it relates in the iht yes mohammed you're right osama you're right as well it is gwr we also know it we also call it as gift with reservation so let's go to the notes and check what gwr is gift with reservation meaning is that you are gifting something to someone but with reservation meaning with some condition if an individual makes a lifetime transfer legal ownership of the asset has been transferred but the donor retains some right in the asset transfer it is known as gift with reservation and here you can see that he has gifted but but with the condition to live in the certain part or for certain period what is the tax treatment of that if the reservation is still in place by the death of the donor this will be placed directly into the donor's estate as gift with uh, reservation meaning it will not be considered as a lifetime gift now what is the disadvantage of if it will not be considered as a lifetime gift the first advantage is although it has been gifted in the life but because of not being considered as a lifetime gift it value will not be locked first thing second thing the annual exemption will not would have would not have been available because of gwr at that time third problem or the third disadvantage that you will un be unable to claim the paper relief on that why because if the reservation is still in a uh, place at the time of donor's death it will be considered to be gifted on death why because because now the donor has died obviously the condition would have been lifted so it will be considered that as if this gift has been made on death because of that it will be added into the death estate on probate value or which we call market value on death and due to that several disadvantages will occur which i have just mentioned number one the value will not be locked so the increase in value will subject to tax no annual exemptions and there will be no availability of paper relief however what if if the exemption or oh sorry if the reservation has been lifted before the death now if the reservation has been lifted before the death in this case it would be deemed lifetime transfer on the date on which the reservation was lifted again without annual exemption now in our example after certain period of time in his life d has lifted the reservation but do remember that the it will now be considered as lifetime gift finally but without annual exemption that's one thing so one disadvantage is still there and the second disadvantage is that it will be considered as if he had made the gift today on the date on which he has lifted the reservation rather than on the actual date on which he has actually gifted so that is what will happen in our case but let me tell you another thing if the asset is of such nature that it is its value has been increased since the 
date on which it was first transferred and then it was later transferred if the value has increased from that date the second gift will be considered as the lifetime transfer however if the gift is of such nature whose value has been decreased over the period due to certain circumstances then hmrc will take the value of the gift which is higher of the both instances the day on which the gift has been made with reservation versus the date on which the reservation was lifted hmrc will compare on which date the value was higher whichever value was higher the gift will be uh, the gift will be considered to be made on that date so that is another disadvantage do remember that whenever you lift the reservation and if the value is lower as compared to when it was made with reservation that value will be considered as a lifetime gift but the taper relief will still be available from the later date on which the reservation has been lifted so th this is the disadvantage of gift with reservation so we'll get back to the question and correlates the date uh, uh, with it as well now in our question j gifted the property to d on 1st june 2019 it was a condition of her that she will continue to live so the first pet will be on 1st june 2019 not the pet rather for the reservation on 12 march 2021 j began living with her sister and she removed the condition so we do we, we we have not been provided with the values so i cannot you know say that which will be considered rather i will discuss uh, with the examiner both the options that which on whichever date the value is higher that will be considered as pet that is one thing secondly the gift will if the value has been increased obviously the gift will be made or deemed to be made on the date on which the condition has been lifted so if j were to die within seven years of this date d has to pay iht on that and if she manages to live more than seven years d will be able to claim the taper relief at least on that now so we are done with the last part first let's move on to the remaining parts if anybody has any questions they can put it in the question section now let's talk about wise criteria now the first is ability to select the employees obviously we will tell him that the freedom that he is after he will gonna have it in c c -SOP, that he will be free to select whatever employees he wish to include in the scheme as far as the ability is concerned then he has asked us about the value so i will tell him that in csop the maximum value of shares that one can grant to each employee is 30000 however as compared to the sip the maximum shares that one can give is 3600 3, first and then obviously the partnership shares and free matching shares then let's talk about the holding period for csop because it is an hmrc's approved share option plan there are no tax implications at the grant date and there are no tax implications on the exercise dates provided that the scheme is between three to ten years because this is the condition of seesaw however for sip if the shares are held completely for five years there will be no tax implications on income tax and nic there will be only cgt but we the examiner has not asked us to discuss the CGT implications. So therefore I will only be focusing on income tax implications. So I'll tell them if it has been held completely for five years, there will be no implications. However, if it will be held for three to five years, there will be IT and IC applicable. And if less than three years, 
then obviously IIT and NI will still be applicable. So these will be the three points which I will discuss for both the CSOP and the share incentive plan. It is up to you whether you can make one heading and under each discuss the option uh, uh, points of both. For example, if you make the heading freedom to select employees under that, it is your choice either to discuss both together or make two separate headings, one for CSOP and one for SIP. So it is entirely up to you which one you prefer. I will prefer to use the option that consumes the lesser time that is to make one headings and combine both. Now. Moving on. The next requirement and we are only left with one requirement that is this. PPR. So the requirement is calculate with brief explanation the PPR and letting relief if any which are available. So you'll we'll start with the gain. The gain has been mentioned in the question. And that is. 145,000 145,000 is the gain. So we'll use the spreadsheet for this part. And we'll make two columns. Exempt and chargeable. Now. Let's start. Daikon purchased his house on 1st July 2013. When he was employed overseas, so he didn't return to the house till January 24th. So how many months will it be six months? So it's up to you whether you want to uh, use. The year yearly method or the monthly method, but I will only suggest to use yearly method if it is exactly six months or one month or one year interval between the dates. So if you want to use the yearly method, then do remember you can only use it if the interval between the dates in the exam is six monthly or one yearly. Otherwise, I will suggest to use the month. So I will be using the monthly format here because I prefer that. So. The exemptions that are available for PPR are. Three years for any reason four years for working within the UK and any period for working abroad last nine months are unconditional. Now they used to be last 18 months, but now they are last nine months now guys. There is one condition that is attached to these three that the house must be occupied before and after the absence period for these reasons. For example, if you have let for any reason. You must have occupied the house before and after same is the case for employment, whether in the UK or whether abroad. Now the thing is that in our question he has bought the house. While he was away. While he was not in the UK. So he returned for the very first time from abroad, meaning that although he was. Away from the house for the employment purposes and it is allowed by HMRC, but there is another condition that the house must be occupied before and after the tenure. He hasn't occupied the house before moving abroad for employment. As far as the first instance is concerned, so for the first six months, I will not be considering it as an exempt period rather it will be chargeable period. So let's open our spreadsheet. Let's write the time. It's from July. 
that's from July 13 to December 13 it will be six months now then he has started living in the house from January 14 apart from when he moved on July 15 meaning he has remained in the house for one and a half years meaning 18 months almost so I will write as that from Jan 14 to June 15 18 months are exempt these are exempt then although he moved for the overseas employment but he has occupied the house before and then he joined back on January 17 means that he has been out of the house for 1.5 years 18 months more but for the overseas employment and he has occupied the house before and after meaning all of the period will qualify for the exemption so jan 16 to December, sorry, July 15 to December 16. Again, these will be exempt months, and we will write in bracket that the reason is overseas employment. To tell the examiner as to why we have taken this in the exemption. Now, guys, he's back and he has owned the house till he sold it. So the remaining period is from January 17. He has acquired the house, but for three months, I guess he has acquired the house January, February, March. He has acquired the house completely. But for the remaining months. He has let out the house. So first we will kick out three months. That is from. Jan 17. To. March 17. These three months again. Will qualify for the exemption period and now remaining all the tenure. He has lived in the house, but he has partially occupied the house. So I will calculate the completing period, but because the 25% of the house has been let out, I will only take the remaining 75%. So from April 2017 till he has sell the house on December of the same year, meaning nine months. Nine last, sorry, it's, uh, he has acquired from April 17 and sold it on December 2021. Yes, so till March 18, it will be one year. March 19, two years, March 23 years, and March 2021, four years. Four years and nine months he has acquired the house. So the last nine months are unconditional, so I will keep them separate. So I will add two lines here. First of all, I will separate the last nine months that is from, or I can just write last nine months that is completely acceptable and write them exempt. The remaining are four years or 48 months. So from April 17 
to March 21. These are four years, but I will write here in bracket occupied 75% of the house to tell examiner why I have not taken full months. Rather, I will take 75% of 48 months, that is 36 months. Now I will apply some formula here so that the software can calculate So guys here we have the months 84 months and six months 84 months are exempt months chargeable months are six months total 90 months So we can now calculate the PPR exemption first PPR will be gain times exempt period divided by total period and that is the gain in the question is mentioned as 145000 times 84 that is the exam period divided by the total period that is 90 84 plus 6 will be 90 so it's 135 3 now Let's this is our PPR relief. Guys, one thing that we have missed is that the remaining 75%, 25% was chargeable that is 12 months here so our total period of ownership will change from this plus this that is 102 and i also have to update my formula here that is 102 it will be 119412 Now this will be my PPR relief. Now I can calculate letting relief. Letting relief is always lower of three figures. The first is 40,000. Second is PPR relief that is this. 119412 and the third is gain on letting period and gain on letting period and that is total gain that is 145,000 if I'm not wrong divided by 102 that is the total period of ownership and multiplied by 12 months for which the house was let out so or what we can do is we can copy this and use the formula here for that that is this divided by this times 12 
So this is our gain on letting period. So guys, out of the total three, what do you think is the lower? Obviously the gain on letting period is the lowest. So this will be the letting relief. Let's bold this figure. Now let's calculate the gain. Chargeable gain. So the chargeable gain is 145,000. Less PPR and letting relief. PPR is negative one one nine four one two and one four zero four eight is the letting relief and therefore the chargeable gain will be one one five four zero however if it would have asked us to calculate the taxable gain we would have deducted the annual exemption as well do remember and look at a close uh, have a, had a close look at the requirements whether it has asked you to calculate the taxable gain on the chargeable gain if chargeable gain then do not deduct the annual exemption if taxable gain then deduct it and if it has asked the cgt liability then apply the rates as well do remember if we would have to ask we would have been asked to calculate the CGT liability I would have applied rates of 18 or 28 percent because it is a residential property. So guys I hope I have answered the question. Uh, okay Rakesh has asked me how I have. Okay Rakesh this is the gain on letting period. This is the total gain that is the 119. Oh, sorry, I have selected wrong amount of gain. It should have been 145,000 as the gain I have selected PPR exemption. And my gain will be so it's 17059. Thank you for highlighting the mistakes uh, rakesh i have wrongly selected the ppr figure rather than the gain figure so guys with that uh, we have finished our bonus question as well so we have managed our time well if anybody has any question related to the subject they can ask me because this is the last day i will dedicate the next three four minutes to your question i hope that these sessions will help you and they do make a difference for you uh, work hard and try to work smart as well don't forget that this is a text planning exam you have to explain explain and explain with the help of calculations and don't forget that your exam will be cbe so do not practice on paper do practice on computer so guys if you have any such questions please post in the question section i wish all of you good luck for the exam So guys with that I would like to sign off. I hope that this sessions will help you best of luck for the exam. And do remember me in your prayers. Thank you. Bye.